Hey guys, I'm Dave and welcome to the Troll Gallery. Today, we're going to make a keepsake box to replace this. My partner Margaret has a couple of items that she likes to keep on her desk. And she's been keeping them in this cardboard box. Well, I just can't have that. So today we're going to make our new box that she can put on her desk and it will look nice. And then we can do this. Let's see how that comes together. I started this build by resawing some zebra wood for the top and bottom of the box. My bandsaw still needs a little work before I can resaw with it, so I decided to use the table saw. But rather than use my regular blade, I remembered that I had a thin curve seven and a quarter inch blade. Not only is this less strain on the saw, but it's sixteenth of an inch curve wastes less wood. I set my fence so the cut was about the center of my stock and started with the blade about three quarters of an inch high. I made a pass on each edge keeping the same face against the fence. I raised the blade a bit and made several passes taking a light cut each time. With the cut complete I can now book match the two halves choosing the more decorative section for the center of my soon to be panel. Before gluing the panel together, I reduced the thickness of the stock to just over its final dimension of a quarter of an inch. This ensured that the two halves were the same thickness. It would also leave me with just a few light passes later once the panel was assembled. To keep the glue up simple, I used a pair of clamps to bring the joint together, and a pair of C-clamps to keep the two halves in plane. One last bar clamp in the center added just a bit more pressure. While the panel was drying, it was time to start on the box sides. I had some walnut that was a half inch thick, but the edges needed some cleanup. I started with my straight edge jig at the table saw and ripped the first edge straight. Then I reset the fence, ripped the second edge parallel to the first, taking my stock down to its final width. I switched over to a quarter inch dado set and set the blade quarter inch high. I cut the groove for the top, and then flipping the stock around, cut the same groove for the bottom. While the stock was still long, I sanded the inside to remove any machining marks. For now, I started at 120 grit and worked my way up to 220. I'll do the final sanding later. Back at the table saw, I set my blade to 45 degrees and grabbed my miter sled. I cut the first miter. Then I set a stop block for the length of the long sides. The white line on the stock will help me align things later. With the stop set, I can make that second miter cut for that first long side. Then I mark the two pieces with a number one. This will also help me to keep the grain flowing during assembly. I flipped the stock and snuck up on the next miter. The goal here is to remove as little stock from the face so that the grain will flow seamlessly around the corner. Since the throat of this jig is so large, I shut the saw off and let the blade stop before trying to remove the cutoff. One day I'll rebuild this sled so that won't be an issue. I had pre-cut a spacer to set next to my stop block that will give me the correct length for my short sides. With that in place, I can make the next cut label the parts, and cut the opposing miter. The other two parts were cut the same way, the long part against the stop block, and the short one against the spacer. And I made sure to label each piece as the cuts were made, so I wouldn't have to try to match up things later by eye. The next day I pulled the panel out of the clamps and used a sharp chisel to remove any remaining glue squeeze out. Back at the plane era, a few light passes clean up the joint. Another pass or two was all that was needed for snug fit into the grooves on the box sides. I determined the approximate size I would need for the panel. Then I could lay out the width on the panel itself. Since I took the time to bookmatch the panel, I'll try to keep that joint in the center of the finished panel. 
In this case, I'll take off about an inch and a half on either side for symmetry. At the table saw, I ripped one edge at my mark, reset the fence, flip my stock around, and rip the panel to width. It's easier to make just one cut, but then you lose the balanced look of your grain, if that makes any sense. I used some blue tape and a quick grip clamp to dry assemble three sides of the box. Then I could use that to check the fit of my panels. It was a little snug, so I trimmed off just a bit. I know this is a small box, but I wanted to leave a little space for wood movement. At the miter saw, I trimmed the first edge square. Then I could set a stop block and trim the piece to length. Another dry assembly and I could test fit the panel's length. Once I was happy with the fit, I could cut the second panel using the stop block to ensure that the two pieces are the same size. I took one of the long sides to the table saw and trimmed off one of the grooves. This would allow the top to slide into place as requested. One more dry fit and everything is looking good. I just need to mill up a matching pole in zebra wood. Just remember to keep your fingers well away from the sharp spinny things when working on small parts. With the two small parts of the pole cut and all ten fingers intact, I can glue them together. A bead of glue and some small clamps and a bit of fussing and the two parts are lined up and left to dry. Once that glue had time to dry, I could cut the miters on the end so it would match the open side of the box. Now it's time to assemble the box itself. As usual, I pre-sanded the interior, including the bottom, through 320 grit. Then I used blue tape on each of the joints to act both as a hinge and a clamp. Then I used an acid brush that I had trimmed short to apply glue on both sides of the joint. End grain can suck up a lot of glue, so you want to make sure you get good coverage. Just not so much that you get a lot of squeeze out. I dropped the bottom into one of the grooves and then rolled up the box before taping up that last corner. A couple of quick grip clamps help hold things securely. A damp paper towel helps clean up any squeeze out and off-camera I checked the square before setting things aside to dry. The original plan was going to be to use a wood that matches the lid as kind of like the pole. But after a meeting with the design team, we decided to go back to the walnut. Now this is the actual piece that came off of here. I'm going to make a filler strip to fill that before attaching it to the top. And that way it'll kind of give it that whole like mystery appearance of how to get in the box if you don't know what you're looking for. All right, let's keep going. One more tiny strip to cut at the table saw. In walnut this time. It was trimmed to length at the miter saw. And then it was glued to the new pole and set aside to dry. Miter joints are notoriously weak, at least on their own. So I'm going to add a pair of splines on each corner to strengthen them. To do that, I'm using my spline jig. It's pretty much a pair of 45 degree plywood ramps that support the box, so I can run it through the table saw. There are two things to keep in mind. First is the blade height. I want the kerf as deep as possible without cutting into the inside of the box. The second is where on the box the splines will sit. They have to be far enough in so they won't hit the grooves for the top and bottom but far enough out so they look balanced and provide extra strength. In this case, the curve started about three quarters of an inch in from the edge of the box on both sides. I set the box in place in the jig, move it through the blade until it hits my stop and then back the jig out. The stop isn't necessary, but it lets me know that I've gone far enough through my box. Then I rotate the box, make the next cut, and so on. Once the bottom curves have been cut, I flip the box so the upper side is facing in 
and then repeat the cuts four more times. The spline stock was milled down at the planer. I clamped a false table in place since my final dimension would be just about an eighth of an inch. I often use contrasting wood for splines to make them pop. You can also use the same species as your box if you want them to blend in. For this box, we decided to go with zebra wood since that would match the top and bottom, while still pretty well blending in with the walnut. Several light passes let me sneak up on a snug fit. At the bandsaw, I cut enough triangles to use the splines. Keeping them just oversized makes cleaning them up easier once they're glued in place. I added a bit of glue on both sides of each spline and set them into the groove. A little wiggle helps to spread the glue. Just make sure to press the spline firmly in place so you don't get any spaces once the glue dries. Like I did, but we'll fix that later. After the glue has had time to dry, I cut the splines flush with a, well, a flush cutting saw. I keep forgetting to put a playing card under the saw, and I paid for my mistake. I slipped a few times and scarred the walnut. We'll come back to those later to make them less noticeable. A quick sanding levels out the splines, cleans up the corner joints, and removes any machine marks. Again, I started with 120 grit and worked my way up to 320 grit. One more glue up and the box should be done. Before gluing the lip to the lid, I covered the box with packing tape to prevent any squeeze out from gluing the lid to the box. Then I used blue tape to minimize any squeeze out between the lid and the lip. With everything protected, I can use the box as a gluing jig to make sure the lid lip and box are all correctly aligned. A bead of glue and some quick grip clamps and the lid is left to dry. Okay guys, so at this point I thought the box was complete. It needs a little touch-up sanding and then we can go to finishing. The original plan was to line the bottom with Kaizen foam keep all her goodies safe. But after another meeting of the design committee, we're going with plan B. Let's pull that one together now. I milled up some three quarter by half inch walnut for the outer frame of the insert. I might add one into the stock set my stop and cut the first long piece. After a few adjustments, I got the length correct and I could use the stop to cut the second long piece. To prevent the stock from being pulled into the blade during these angled cuts, I use a clamp to hold it in place. I use the same procedure for the two short sides until everything fits snugly inside the box. Then I did it all over again, but this time with 3 quarter inch by 3 eighths stock because I miscalculated the space I needed there. Oh well. The two dividers are three quarters by a quarter inch, and I could have easily cut just a couple of simple dados for them to nest into, but why make things easy? I decided to use a 90 degree V-groove bit to make those grooves, and I built this jig to hold things together. After marking the center lines for the grooves, I set my palm router in place with the center of the bit on those lines and then marked the jig at the edge of the router base. I used a square to transfer the outermost point of the base and those would be my layout lines for a fence. I screwed the fence in place. Then I could adjust the depth of cut so it was just the width of my divider stock. Once I got the width just right, I made the first cut across the two side pieces. A quick reset of the fence and the second cut was made. The finished sides look like this. To cut the mating joints on the dividers, I built another jig, this time for use with my table router. I chucked up a 45 degree chamfer bit and adjusted the fence and the bit height. 
The jig holds the small stock safely so I could run the short end grain against the bit. I ran one face, flipped the stock over, and then ran the opposite face, leaving me with a perfect 90 degree point. After several test cuts, I set the stop lock at the miter saw and cut the divider to length. Then it was back to the rudder table to make those miter cuts again. When everything fit just right, the second divider was cut the same way, and everything looks great. I glued the insert frame just like I did the box. Blue tape to hold things together, glue on both sides of the joint, roll it up, and then add a few clamps for good measure. I didn't glue in the dividers, they'll just be set in place with the pressure fit. And yes, I checked for square again. After the glue had time to set up, the insert got a little sanding, and it was time to see how it fit. If you were wondering why I was sanding everything to 320 grit, you're gonna love this. The final sanding is actually by hand at 400 and then 600 grit. This is more like burnishing the wood than sanding, but I think it's really key to getting the beautiful finish in the next step. And it's hard to see on camera, but the wood actually has a sheen after the 600 grit sanding. I've been using Danish oil finishes for decades. I like the way it makes the grain pop. It leaves a finish that begs to be touched. It's easy to repair and it's forgiving in a dusty shop. I apply the oil with a clean cotton rag and make sure to coat all the surfaces of the box. For those tight corners, an acid brush is great. I even use it to get into the grooves for the box top. I let the oil sit for about 20 minutes and then come back and wipe off the excess. Then it's one coat per day for six days, each time wiping on the oil, letting it sit, and then wiping off the excess. Remember those scratches from the flush cutting saw? Or the space or two by the splines? I'm going to hide those with my fast capped soft wax kit. It's easy to use, you just pick the color that most closely matches your work, rub the wax into the void, and then buff off the excess. I did this between the fifth and sixth coats of oil. The final step was a coat or two of paste wax. I like Brie wax because I think it's easy to use and I prefer it over other furniture waxes I've used in the past. Just don't leave it in your shop in Florida in the summer. You simply rub it on, let it dry and buff it out. And a second coat adds just a bit more protection. Margaret couldn't be happy with the way her box turned out. She loves the way that the grain just flows around the corners. The splines match the top and bottom, but still don't really stand out too much from the walnut. The top slides right off and the inserts will hold her things just right. And despite the fact that we had a few changes to the design as we went, in the grand scheme of things, they turned out awesome. Love to hear your thoughts on this video. Was there something I could have done differently? Smarter? Safer? Quicker? Drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. And if you enjoyed this video, maybe give us a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you haven't already, maybe it's time to hit that subscribe button and the little bell so you can get notified each time I put out our new video. As usual, I don't have a clue what's coming up next, but should be something interesting. So until then, have a great day. 
Stay safe and take care. We'll see you soon. I gotta go put this on Margaret's desk.